everybody, welcome and thank you for joining us again. This is the fourth in a series of podcasts focusing on high leverage world language performance assessments produced by the National Foreign Language Resource Center at the University of Hawaii in Manoa. In this series, we are focusing on performance assessments in world languages, and we are working our way up to a discussion of integrated performance assessments later in this series. In our last episode, Iman Hashem shared strategies for designing robust assessments in the interpersonal mode. We will be exploring the logistics of the interpersonal mode, including how to administer assessments of the interpersonal mode, both in person and in distance learning formats, as well as helpful technology tools. So I am so pleased and honored to welcome our very special guest, Ying Jin who is the 2018 Actful National Language Teacher of the Year. Ying is currently teaching at Fremont Union High School District located in the heart of the Silicon Valley. And her job is split between two high schools, Cupertino High School and Homestead High School. Thank you so much for joining us, Ying. My pleasure. Thank you, Nicole. And thank you, NFLRC. <gasps> Um, so as we revisit the interpersonal mode, can you tell us first what are some of the characteristics that you personally like to keep in mind when you're designing interpersonal tasks for novice, intermediate, and advanced language learners? Thank you, Nicole, for the question. And when I design uh, interpersonal tasks in my classroom, I usually keep the following in my mind. Number one, very important, familiar topics. Mm -hmm. And I think, yeah, students have to know what, you know, uh, you're going to ask them to do. And they, they, they have the language ready to, uh, you know, execute the task. Number two is, I think, uh, keep in mind, the goal is for students to use the language. Or in other words, I want them to create sentences or maybe even short paragraphs. You know, it's not just... Uh, checking to see if they memorize some certain words or expressions. No, create uh, the language. And of course, spontaneous is the key. And any like rehearsed <laughs> activities or memorized, uh, you know, paragraphs. No, 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 they are not interpersonal. And another thing very important is um, I want to see students be able to, you know, negotiate meaning, asking and answering questions. It's not just say, I, you ask me, I answer, that's it. No, can we expand the topic? Do you have a follow, logical follow-up question to ask? That's, that's really crucial. And the last one is, I think I really want to use interpersonal um, activities to build relationship among students. To, you know, to build the community. We're not just doing the language. Let's go beyond that. Can we get to know each other more? Can we, you know, find some, something interesting about your partners? So those are the things I usually want to remind myself. I think those are all really important, but I actually kind of want to go back to that, that importance of building the community and the relationships. I think it's something that as language teachers, we actually have a really outstanding and unique opportunity compared to any other subject area to really bring our students' voices and experiences into the room and to have our students know each other in ways that just don't happen in the other subject areas. Absolutely. I but as you said, I mean, that can only happen if we give them opportunities to have authentic conversations. Yes, yes. totally, totally. I got goosebumps. Oh my God. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, teachers often say that they actually find the interpersonal tasks the most difficult to actually just administer. So what advice do you have, logistically speaking, for administering interpersonal tasks in the classroom, such as classroom management um, and so on? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember in the uh, early years when, when I started teaching, I found myself, um, you know, uh, keep saying, 
说中文 ，which is means speaking Chinese. I was like, no, that's not the only thing I should do. And um, and I, you know, sat down and reflected, and I realized that I definitely need to take steps、uh, mm. when I, you know, want to administer、uh, interpersonal activities. I think step one is I need to clearly explain what I want my students to do. You know, including the procedure, the steps. You know,、uh, please make sure you don't do this, or make sure you do this. You know, that kind of thing. And、um, well, on the other, it's a good opportunity for them to practice their listening. You know, in academic language. You know、uh, what. They, you know, my expectations are, and number two is the key, modeling. I definitely need to not just, you know, tell them. I want to show them、uh, what I want them to do, and of course, if you have、um, a student teacher or you have another、uh, teacher happen to be available, great. You can demonstrate and show the class. If not, I think find a student. Whose language might might be a little advanced, and do it in front. Sometimes doing once even not enough. You might need to do twice. <laughs> But definitely give students an opportunity to visualize what the activity is like. And last thing is, I think I need to figure out a way to hold my students accountable. Meaning that I need to figure out a way to collect evidence. So at the end of this activity, this is what I want to see from you guys. There are of course different ways. Either fill out a、uh, you know practice worksheet, you know、uh, write down information you collected from the conversation, or do a report. I can even randomly I tell them ahead of time. At the end, I'm going to randomly ask you guys to share. What you have done, what you have learned. So, I think、um, this is what I have been doing. I I think it works pretty well, and、um, just yeah, just want to share with you know、um, other teachers. I'm pretty sure there are other good ideas. So it will be great if we can get a chance to you know share more ideas. Right. Well, and I think you know one of the first things you said was、um, you went back to kind of your earlier days of teaching and how you found yourself constantly reminding students to please speak in Chinese, and you you hit on a point which is, as teachers, if we are finding ourselves having to remind the students to speak the target language, it's usually a sign that for whatever reason the students actually don't think they are equipped to do the task. They would be speaking the target language if they thought they could. Mm-hmm. Right. So then we look back on what was that missing piece, and then you laid out all those steps.、Um, and I really liked on your third one for the accountability. It wasn't just accountability for you collecting evidence, but you are actually holding them accountable for listening to each other. Yes. And the strategy you gave for that, where it's like I'm going to be asking you to share out some of what happened in your conversations. So.、Um, Do you have any particular tips, for example, during an in-person class? You know, when we get to see students in our physical classrooms again,、um, do you have any tips for how you like to logistically handle the the need to be、um, evaluating an interpersonal task, either between yourself and a student or between two students, while the rest of the class is not doing that and they're doing something else?、Mm. Uh, okay. Um, I think, generally speaking,、uh, if we want students to do interpersonal pair work, it might be easier. But if we're talking about a group or even maybe the whole class, it it's a big challenge. I think、uh, usually what I do for like a whole class activity is debate, and I think I want to involve every student. Uh, in the preparation stage, meaning that I will give you an example later. So, preparation stage, everyone is actively, you know,、uh, working on the task. And then in the debate stage, I still need to、uh, again hold everybody accountable, meaning that, you know, 
everybody prepares, but when we come to the actually talking, usually it's two students talking to each other. I cannot like 40 students talking at the same time. It won't work that way. But although only two students are talking, I still need the rest of the class to be involved. Meaning that, say, I'm, I just tell them, I might, this is for my upper level class. I might stop you at some certain point and ask a, a clarification question or a follow-up question. I even don't know what I'm going to ask. It really like spontaneous, right? And I might ask the question to the audience. Say, um, so you need to listen. You need to follow what, where the conversation is going in order to, to be able to answer my question. And the example I want to share is um, just recently, I did this with my Chinese for honor class. And we were on a uh, unit talking about personal, you know, money management, you know, personal spending, that topic. And um, I learned um, a um, um, discussion strategy called six thinking hats. Love it. Just love it so much. So um, I give students a scenario, uh, say one student, uh, happen to spend too much. <laughs> so now, uh, just based on this situation, this problem, I divided this class into different groups. You know, one group uh, was representing parents of this student. One group was just this student himself or herself. One group uh, was, working on, was working as um, his classmate and friends. And one group, um, actually, a siblings. So from different perspectives, work on what kind of suggestions or opinions you want to share. And I think um, the question we had was, should parents help this student, like give him more money or help him or not? And they have to debate, like, yes, you should, or no, you shouldn't. And of course, you know, every group had a chance to, uh, you know, express themselves. But actually, I think because the topic itself was really of students' interest. So everybody was actively listening and trying to say, no, this is not right. You shouldn't do this. Or yes, you should do this. And I think, yes, everybody was in the preparation stage, was in the breakout room, you know, you know come up with like, uh, all the reasons should or should not. And then we came back to the main room and they started like, I was like, okay, you know, from the student group, one student, please tell us the first reason why we should help you. And mom's group, please tell us yes or no. So I think there are still, um, let's say strategies or steps we can follow to uh, administer, administer a, a whole group uh, interpersonal um, you know, activity. But it, I have to say it takes a lot of planning. You have to think about all the details and, and of course, but I enjoy it a lot. I learned a lot from my students. Absolutely, thank you. No, I think um, doing a whole class interpersonal assessment is challenging, particularly because the, the nature of what interpersonal requires and that negotiation of meaning, our novice users of language may or may not really be equipped and ready with the skills that would be necessary. And this is something that you're going to work them up towards with these micro tasks throughout their years as a novice user of language so that you can have that kind of robust dynamic <laughs> large group conversation with different ideas coming in. And at the same time, you're actually kind of helping them build and, and develop the ability to practice turn taking in a bigger group setting and, and clarifying and restating and all of those kinds of things. Yes, totally. Totally. Um, so you actually kind of started to lead right into the next question, which is a little more focused on the, the fact that probably in the fall we're, almost everyone is looking at 
some kind of blended or even possibly completely distanced learning. Mm -hmm. um, so what strategies and also what specific technology tools do you recommend for both practicing the interpersonal mode and then for administering interpersonal performance assessment tasks? Mm. And to be honest with you, I'm a little worried because next year I know I'm going to teach Chinese one. You know, the beginners, I'm really worried how I can really, uh, you know, make this work. So I, during the summer, you know, thanks to our school district, uh, the school district provides us with opportunities to collaborate. So I'm, I'm working with Chinese teachers, you know, who is going to teach Chinese one as well. We're brainstorming, thinking really hard. Okay, so again, I think what I want to do first is definitely, again, back to the magic word relationship. I need my students feel comfortable, uh, you know, coming to my class and I need to uh, encourage them to talk. Um, especially, you know, for um, a language like Chinese, it's, it's it's not easy. <laughs> and I never tell my students this, but I have to say, yes, it really takes courage to open your mouth and, you know, say it. And for me, I think I want to remind myself, focus on the message. In other words, I think meanings should be more important than form, forms. And um, I, you know, when I reflected, I realized that even today, sometimes I just had to remind myself, hold it, hold it. You, you don't want to just, you know, stop your students talking. When he or she is in the mode of, you know, talking, just, you know, take a deep breath and don't just jump in. Yes. And um, definitely, I, I know it's a big, big uh, challenge to everybody when we do this interpersonal task online, definitely. And uh, talking about specific uh, technology tools, um, I have been using Padlet, Flipgrid. I think people are pretty familiar with that. And recently I found a uh, Chrome add-on called Moat, M-O-T-E. I love it. And uh, this is this add-on allows you to, to do a voice recording on uh, Google Doc, Google Slide, and Google Sheet. And that I just think we can use this creatively, use this tool creatively, creatively <laughs> to uh, you know, design some interpersonal um, tasks. For example, on a Google Doc, I can give my students a task and student A can come here to record his response to this task. And student B can later on join, listen to student A's you know, response and then give another follow-up response. And it's just, I think uh, I tried it uh, a little bit this year. I, I really like what I, I have seen. So we'll explore more on that. Um, yeah, thank you. Oh, go ahead. No, sorry. And uh, also, uh, when we started remote learning, remote teaching, you know, I, I like breakout room, but my problem was that I couldn't be in different breakout rooms at the same time. I had to jump, you know, between this one, among this one or that one. So later on, I just thought, why don't I ask my students to record? I don't know why I didn't think about that at the beginning. And that's what I uh, did with my students. Like I found one student and usually they're you know, good kids. They just, they want to help me. So I say record it and send the video or audio to me after the meeting is done. So with that, I think I can get a better idea what was going on in that breakout room when I was not physically there. Yeah, sorry. So no, that's awesome. And it's a really big consideration. So when I'm working with teachers in my own district and beyond, you know, and talking about breakout rooms, they, they have a lot of potential, but 
you also, I mean, in some cases, we know we have students who aren't quite ready for that level of permission and access without some yeah. adult supervision. Um, and so you have to be thoughtful about, can I do, is this a group of students I can ass safely assign to breakout rooms or do I need to see if I can have some additional adults yeah. <laughs> come in and also be in those breakout rooms? Um, and so the recording feature might be a great way to go. And you had mentioned Flipgrid, which can do a similar thing to the Chrome add-on moat, where in the sense that you could have students reply to each other asynchronously, um, you know, via video, and then you just want to give them those instructions that say, this isn't about being perfect. Listen, press record, talk, stop recording, and submit. Done. Absolutely. Right? Yes. Um, so that they really practice as much as possible. And that would be true if they used the Chrome add-on as well, right? Where it's like, I don't want you to turn this into a presentational task that you've no. edited and refined and practiced and rehearsed no. and perfected, yeah. right? I want you to just say what comes to mind, stop recording and let it be. Yes. Uh, yes. Another tool that I've just started exploring, um, and it is a freemium tool, meaning it has limitations for the free version. Mm -hmm. And then if you want full access, you'd, you would have to get a license, is Extempore. E X T E M P O R E, okay. um, and it's um, it's interesting because it actually allows you to completely simulate an interpersonal task. Now it would be primarily you and a student. In other words, you would provide one half of the conversation. I see. Um, and what it does is it lets you, as the teacher, determine the parameters for. Um, can the students, let's say you open the conversation with a question, can right. the students listen to it again or not? You get to decide ah. as in kind of like with a real conversation, right? Or when it's time, when they're list, they've done listening to it and they need to answer the question, you as the teacher set up in the activity, whether or not the student um, can have more than one attempt when they record oh. their response and do they have a time limit? Wow, I love um, it. This so it's, I will say that the free version is quite limited. It kind of drives you to the paid version pretty quickly. <laughs> um, but it is one of the only tools out there. I think linked language might still be floating around. It's a tool I used to use that was similar that would actually let you set up like two-sided conversations that they could just right. go in and do. Right. Right. Um, but w if we go back to distance learning, people might be looking for you know, more opportunities to kind of simulate that sense of you just need to talk and you don't need to worry about perfecting it. So the system's not going to let you worry about it. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Oh, wow. Thank you for sharing this. Oh, you're welcome. Yeah. <laughs> We're all here to share, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are there any particular challenges or even pitfalls that you think teachers should look out for as they design and implement their interpersonal tasks? Mm, mm, mm. Uh, I think the first one, uh, you know, um, came to my mind is, um, how do we uh, make sure our students have opportunities to practice how to ask questions? Yes. Right? This is... I found so many times I found myself being the only person asking questions in the class. So, but no, well, in, if we want to do interpersonal, they need to, they need to be uh, able to ask questions. So, and the, uh, another one um, I think we need to keep in mind is, are the topics or the tasks meaningful? are those related to students' real life? Are students interested in those topics? And so we really have to think from, you know, students' perspective. Uh, I know sometimes it, was, it happened, again, happened to me. I thought I found a really good topic, but, you know, nobody wanted to, to say anything about it. So... I guess uh, for teachers, we, again, back to the relationship, we need to, um, to really know the students, have an uh, opportunity to really know in depth about their thoughts, their, you know, what they care, what they are interested in. And uh, the last one I want to say is, well, I think we talk about this as well, the community and the trust, are, are those things, there among students. So they are not afraid of talking to each other. And uh, I, 
of course, in each class, you see some kids who just advance faster than some other students. So especially for those students who need extra support, do we have this momentum in the class? Like everyone is there to support these kids. Not like, ah, you don't know how to say it. No, no, that's not acceptable. We're all here learning. So those things I think we need to keep in mind. And um, definitely, I think the list can be really long. But for me, those things are definitely um, my priority. Well, absolutely, because, you know, the interpersonal skills are probably the biggest risk in many cases for a lot of our learners because of the fact that they're spontaneous, yes. not rehearsed and not prepared. Mm -hmm. um, some people say they're afraid of public speaking, but as you prepare them and let them rehearse and prepare and refine, it's okay by the time they get to the point of actually doing it. So that leaves, that goes back to the interpersonal task being the one that actually tends to build some anxiety <laughs> for learners. So that trust is absolutely critical and they won't engage if the task isn't meaningful. Like you said, like it does, it doesn't matter how great you think the task is. If it doesn't resonate with them, there no. will be no conversation happening. Um, what are some specific ways you, I've talked about this a lot too with teachers where if our students have the opportunity to use the language outside of our classrooms, mm. especially as novice to intermediate users of language, as most of ours will be when they exit our programs at whatever level they exit, um, you know, they're going to be the ones asking all the questions. Right. <laughs> so, you had said, so you had said, you know, that it's really important to make sure students have opportunities. Do you have any specific like favorite things that you do in order to kind of get the students to be the ones asking the questions more often? Uh, I, I usually started by uh, doing a little uh, warm up activity at the beginning of the class, which is like, it's called asking Jin Lao Shi, like ask me questions. I think students really want to know their teachers. So, oh my God, I told the kids, okay, we're going to do this. And they started to prepare questions. And I, I saw some kids walk into the classroom with like, I have my list ready to ask her today. <laughs> and um, uh, also uh, I saw my colleagues doing this. Uh, they have a big jar in the classroom, uh, you know, with all the questions, you know, inside the jar. And again, at the beginning, or, you know, it can be at the end as an exit slip or, what, what, whenever you see fit, the teacher holds the jar and walk around in the classroom and, uh, you know, just give the jar to one of the students. And the student just randomly picks one question and then randomly pick a classmate to ask this question. I, I think, um, again, make, I, I know, we, we, I, I'm pretty sure we all uh, encountered this, they want to ask a question beyond their language. So I have seen so many times, I want to ask you this, but my language is not there. I really think that's a good, actually, uh, teaching moment or learning moment. So this is what they want to say. Give them an opportunity to say it. Help them to learn how to say what they want to say. Um, I, I enjoy doing this. I, I did uh, asking Jin Lao Shi a question, ask me a question. And later on, we moved to ask your classmate a question. And you, we can keep doing, or I sometimes assign certain topics for students to prepare questions and ask. And eventually for uh, you know, novice high, intermediate, low students, it's not just simply, what's your name, you know, where are you from? It becomes more complicated. And I definitely, I saw real conversation happening among students. So it's good. Yeah, absolutely. The jar reminds me of what I used to do with my year ones and year twos, where they would, I would actually give them um, little index cards. And every time we learned new questions, they would write them down. So they had their own little bank of questions. Ooh. And at any time, they could pull them out if they needed them, um, if I asked them, to, but if they didn't need them, it was, you know, it was fine not to use the question bank. But I also had them put their own personal answer on the back ah. so that if they asked it, because one of the things about language is it goes there, you don't get to forget anything. 
right? <laughs> the stuff you learned on day one in year one, you still need on the last day of year yes. four. Um, you don't get to forget anything. So having that type of activity, like with the jar, for example, or, or with the, the question bank that my individual students had, it allows them to keep bringing back and recycling material over and over and over and over again. And by having them put the answers on the back, that was a way to build in, especially for the novice users, a strategy they could use to support their partner if their partner yes. didn't know how to answer the question, looked at them blankly and was like, I don't remember that question. <laughs> they could say in French, for example, and then give their own personal answer. Right. Um, so that we're helping them build that strategy as well. Um, and that is that is just something that's, I think just giving them the opportunities to ask those questions and to keep asking questions and to get more and more comfortable mm -hmm. with it. And then to get comfortable, like you said, in having a real conversation where it's yeah. not just a checkoff. Yeah. Well, I asked my question, you answered, we're done here. Um, can they react in appropriate ways and yeah. respond, ask follow-up questions um, and all those things we can be building in all the time, starting from as soon as they start learning their first question words. Totally, totally. Absolutely. Um, and then would you say in terms of challenges or pitfalls for teachers to look out for, again, with the interpersonal task, but this time specifically related to perhaps navigating that with distance learning, mm -hmm. is there anything in particular you would call out? Uh, or with the administration of tasks, you know what I mean? Like just any aspect of those interpersonal tasks, uh -huh. whether it's administration I, or. I feel like, um, um, how should I say this? I just feel like. I don't know what's going on behind my, my screen, behind the camera. And uh, I still say, um, I still do this interpersonal talking, uh, I call them random talk at the beginning of my uh, each class. And uh, luckily, uh, okay, when my school closed, it was really um, was like a sudden clo closure. And, um, but we did, get a chance to go back to our classroom to pick up what we need. And what I picked up was, I have it here, the lipstick. <laughs> so when I show this in front of, uh, you know, on Zoom, in front of the camera, I heard my students, no! <laughs> and, but you know, again, I told them, um, I don't see you like, in, inside a classroom setting, but I still want you to be with me. And I want you to, you know, focus, to concentrate, and I want a chance to talk to you. I want to find out how you are feeling, how you are doing with your, you know, uh, at home studying, how, how is everything? So um, I used to ask questions closely related to the, the chapter, the theme, you know, we were working on, but when we started online uh, learning, I asked questions really just check, check out how they are doing. Like, when did you go to sleep last night? And, uh, you know, um, what did you eat? And uh, is your, what do you have in your room? You know, I think uh, for me, especially in this special difficult time, I think we, we, Kids need that kind of caring. They, they, they know we care. They know we are there with them. So still, but again, they answer me. I ask in Chinese, they answer me in Chinese. It's still interpersonal. Yes. Yeah. So I, I but still, I feel it's so challenging and compared with other modes, presentational and interpretive, I just feel like doing interpersonal online is big challenge. It might be the biggest challenge for me. <laughs> it is. But you know what you, what you called out there is really critical. So just recently, you know what, within the last two years, maybe we've started hearing a lot about social emotional learning. Maybe it's been three years. Um, and a lot of us, we weren't trained in how to, how to develop and foster our students' social emotional health. Um, and how to help them learn about who they are and how they respond to situations. But we're learning, you know, we started a few years ago saying, oh, this is also important. We need to support our students in these wow. areas. Well, when the shutdown happened, and it was definitely abrupt for all of us, yeah. when the shutdown happened, it became really apparent that 
it is absolutely critical that we make substantial space alongside our academic content for the social emotional learning pieces. And as language teachers, you pulled, you called out exactly that, that we have the opportunity to weave those together rather than being separate things so that our students are not only still feeling like members of our community, but are also just feeling valued and supported for who they are as individuals and where they're coming from when they come to this learning with us. You said it so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> you did too you called you do yes absolutely yeah. um so what would what is the relationship between performance assessments in the interpersonal um, mode and lifelong learning <laughs> um, i think i have said this to some other teachers i said you know we have been telling our kids to be lifelong learner how about ourselves we need to be lifelong learners ourselves first especially nobody i think uh could predict we're now teaching online <laughs> this is we have to adopt we have to learn so many new things so i think um Definitely lifelong learning should be on our agenda and should be what we're working on with our students on a daily basis. And uh, think, about, um, think about this, interpersonal skill, interpersonal communication is not only uh, needed as like, part of our curriculum. In real life, we all need interpersonal skill every moment right you know spontaneous communication and uh, exchange information through messages negotiation of meaning and also those uh, paraverbal communication skills that involves culture and a lot of other things say um, I just feel like we we are not just teaching it should be uh, shared with our students. It's not just learning a language. It's not just learning how to talk. It's communication. And it's one of the top soft skills needed in workplace. How to be a clear communicator, how to engage in active listening, and uh, you know, how to learn how to behave appropriately and uh, being receptive to feedback, all of those problem solving, those are all part of the, um, uh, you know, embedded in interpersonal communication. So definitely, I like the idea, say, maybe we can involve students to design uh, assessment, let them do self-assessment. And um, we, we, share our expectations rubrics with them and let i think i really think self-reflection is so powerful it will help you to grow personally and professionally so well it's not just again interpersonal communication is not just for learning uh, learning languages it's for for the benefit of your real life yeah it's a it's a life skill it is it, we really are the only subject area that has as its core yeah. this mission to really help our learners be able to navigate situations and interactions with people whose perspectives are different from their own, whose experiences are different from their own, and whose language might be different from their native language, depending on how they, you know, where they've come from in their path in their lives. And so it goes way beyond the words. It's, you know, it's the whole reason why, although they're getting better, automatic translation tools still fall short because they don't have the ability to navigate cultural nuance, right? Yeah. For example. Um, and so one of the things that, that you called out is just that, that it's, it's so much more language. Isn't just words. Language is actually driven by culture and driven by cultural perspectives. It's precisely why languages are structured differently from each other. Yep. Right? It wasn't just set up to make it hard for people to learn other languages. The, the way language is set up in each individual language and the structure and the word order and the things that do ah. exist in some and don't exist in others all go back to cultural perspectives and so on about how to, what's important to communicate and how to communicate those ideas. So 
you know, this, these interpersonal skills are critical. And, yes. you know, that's, I think, why we always are advocating for more and more students to be learning languages, starting younger, yep. um, and having longer sequences of language education yeah. um, oh, so cool. that they can get there. But I'm really curious about what you said about, the, about self-assessment. Can you maybe give an example of what self-assessment might look like in the interpersonal mode? Okay. Um, say, uh, one simple rubric I use a lot. I think I learned it from uh, a teacher from, I believe, Wisconsin. I think uh, the last name is Maury, a French teacher, by the way. It's very simple. It's a uh, move from, move to. And move from, from uh, maybe ask uh, random questions. Move to ask logical uh, follow-up questions. I think a lot of rubrics uh, we see are designed for teachers, not for students. So many jargons, you know, <laughs> sentences. But I want simple, straightforward rubric with easy words, but, you know, uh, give us a clear direction where we want our students to go, where, what the goals are. And uh, I give this rubric to my students when they do interpersonal, you know, uh, pair talk. And I ask them at the end, before you finish and, you know, change partner, make sure to um, pause and reflect on what you just did. You know, do a quick assessment on yourself, about yourself and also about your partner. Tell your partner, I think you did very well on this, but maybe you can improve a little more on that. And I think um, we, we need more rubrics like that. Simple, student-friendly rubrics. And with that, students can know uh, where they are and where they want to go. And I think um, definitely... Um, it looks simple, but I definitely believe uh, the power of, you know, this kind of rubric. And also, I think it gives students um, uh, a signal. Uh, keep in mind, you are not just doing some random talk. It's a, it's a task. And I have a, uh, a goal, a clear goal behind this task. So I, this is, uh, I think, what I have been doing a lot. Uh, with my students. Of course, when we move online, it becomes a little hard. I had to open so many, I have big class. I, uh, I have a class with uh, 39 students. So I had to open so many <laughs> breakout rooms. So they, when they you know, joined, they could do a pair of interpersonal talking, speaking activity. Yeah. Well, you know, what you're calling out when you say that the, that the rubrics are for learners and not just for the teachers is the fact that actually as educators, we should be providing the rubrics to the learners, you know, from early on in the process. For example, I, when we started a new unit, I liked to give my students a document that had the um, can-do statements or the learning targets for the unit. And then it also told them exactly how each learning target would be assessed, often in multiple ways, like because they connect, right? We can't right. just always separate out every mode of communication as if it doesn't happen in conjunction with others. Um, and so, and then I would give them the rubrics for how that was going to be assessed so that they had the information they needed to check their own learning Yes. along the way and so that as we did those micro practice tasks leading up to the assessment tasks they had what they needed to do exactly what you were saying was really reflect on and self-assess on how they're doing and and where their struggles are and they have the language and the rubric to give them actionable feedback for what their next steps might be and i really like how you have them helping each other <laughs> with that yeah <laughs> but I love interpersonal communication and yes. uh, yeah, definitely would like, it would be great if we can have, you know, uh, more teachers come and share their ideas. I know we, we can learn from each other a lot. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So thank you so much, Ying, for joining us um, in this episode of the podcast. I think everything that you shared and your personal experiences and everything that you've brought to your work and to your learners um, is going to be so valuable for everybody who's listening. So again, I just really want to thank you and tell you how much I appreciate you 
um, coming, coming here to do this with us and then sharing everything that you've done. My pleasure. It's really nice to have this opportunity to actually learn from you, Nicole. And thank <laughs> you for all the information you shared with me. It's oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, like, that is mine. Is, thank you. The listeners didn't know we know each other. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just pretend. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> You're so welcome. And that brings to an end this episode. But coming up in our next episode, we'll be moving into the interpretive mode with our special guest, Meg Malone. So be sure to tune in for that one and we'll see you then. 